Good afternoon and welcome to the DTG's first panel session uh, looking at how we secure the future of the UK's TV experience and industry. Um, and as this unprecedented year comes to a close, we look forward to uh, a once in a generation opportunity to work with industry, government, Ofcom, uh, and you to shape the television ecosystem of the future in 2021. Um, technology and the resulting capabilities have advanced exponentially uh, and we are coming to the point where it feels like there's almost anything we cannot do. Um, we'll explore how the UK needs to cut through the almost limitless possibilities to develop, control, fund, deploy and monetize the winners. Getting it right will secure a world-class experience for UK consumers uh, from a world-leading UK sector, um, protecting the consumer choice and sustaining an open and competitive market. Um, getting it wrong, of course, won't. Um, so uh, no mean feat. Um, so I'm now gonna ask uh, each of our panelists to introduce themselves uh, and begin to address what they believe are the key challenges and opportunities in securing the future of the UK's TV experience and industry. Patrick. Uh, I'm Patrick Barwise. I'm a uh, Emeritus Professor of Management and Marketing at London Business School, uh, but I have a very long term interest in uh, media as well. And I've just um, co authored a book with Peter York called The War Against the BBC. So uh, some of these issues are very much front of mind. Uh, Richard, you want me to go straight into my answer to the exam question or uh, we yes, yes, that would be that would be a brilliant start. Okay, well, the um, Ofcom consultation rightly says that the UK media sector is a success story, and that PSB is at the heart of that success story, and that the BBC is at the centre of the whole ecosystem. However, not only is the BBC under relentless attack, um, but it's also uh, had its funding cut far more than most people have realized. If the BBC's public funding had simply kept pace with general inflation since 2010, never mind kept pace with uh, the increase in real um, uh, content costs and, and now distribution costs, if it had simply kept pace with general inflation, its annual revenue would be nearly 1.4 billion higher. And that's much more than most people have realized. And of course that would give it plenty of resource to straddle the two horses of investing more in new technologies and in new content and services for younger viewers and listeners without abandoning its traditional technologies uh, and audiences. So the single thing that we can do as a country to ensure the long-term success uh, of public service broadcasting is to make sure the BBC is properly funded. And the single way of doing that uh, at a stroke would be for uh, free TV licenses, which is a welfare benefit, once again, to be funded out of general taxation as they were before. And as the much more expensive free uh, winter fuel allowance uh, currently is. So this is a welfare benefit, it should be funded out of general taxation. And if we did that, the problem wouldn't go away, but uh, it would be largely solved. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and Claudia, you've got a much more international view. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Greetings from Geneva. I'm uh, Claudia Vaccarone. I'm an independent uh, consultant in marketing, communications, gender equality and diversity. Um, and I've been in the industry for about 20 years, uh, first in Paris with the leading satellite operator at Utilsat, so coming from the tech and distribution part of the industry. And then lately, uh, I spent two very interesting and insightful years with the European Broadcasting Union leading some of their diversity programs for members. Um, so my answer to how do we secure the future um, of the UK uh, TV industry is, I would say, I would like to add that is by bringing to these uh, very uh, timely and brilliant consultations, everybody, making sure that everybody's sitting at those decision-making tables. Um, I think that it's pretty obvious that uh, this is a brilliant industry, but it's been very much white male uh, up until now. 
uh, at uh, in some particular aspect, in some particular vertical, particularly the technology and the broadcast is like excruciatingly only white male. And so there is an urgent need to correct that and to bring, um, you know, around the table that diversity that helps innovate, that bring different perspective, but also that reflects the reality of the audiences that PSB uh, are there to serve. You know, public service media is there to reflect uh, and to uh, and to the diversity of the audiences that they're there to serve. So that would be my suggestion. Excellent, thank you. We'll, we'll come back to that. Um, I was thinking if we can reflect our audiences and everything we do, we're, we're going to be in good shape. Um, Mark, uh, can you introduce yourself and give your perspective? So hello, everybody. My name is Mark Vasey. I'm general manager for Panasonic TV, TV development within the UK. Uh, and obviously being a manufacturer, you know, my, my focus is really looking at sort of the industry and the collaboration around the industry, very much around uh, the, the standards and the interoperability that, you know, help not only the broadcasters, the, the IP operators, but also the manufacturers um, deploy you know, products and services, you know, and great content um, into the UK. Um, so certainly this continuation of, you know, great industry collaboration within the UK is absolutely essential going forward. Um, I think there is also um, a, a lot of uh, opportunities to strengthen the strategic partnerships between a lot of the PSPs as well. Um, we can go into that much um, in a little bit more detail later, but certainly looking at some of the changes that we've seen in the online world with, with the likes of uh, BritBox um, as, a, as a service which pulls together a lot of content from at least three of the PSPs, if not more, uh, but also as well services and platforms like Freeview Play, which looks at the aggregation of the metadata again, to try and create a single platform, but, but in, some, in some ways fall slightly short. And again, we can discuss that a bit more. But I think one of the key questions really has to be around um, this, this understanding that the, uh, that the UK is losing ground against the global giants. I think we really need to look at that and understand why that is. And um, there's been suggestions that this may be related to prominence on devices. Personally, I don't believe that that's the case. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that that really is, is one of the key issues on, on, on looking at how uh, these global players have actually made, you know, very, very large inroads into the industry um, and are taking away, well, taking away, but, but adding a lot of content, um, but potentially taking that away from viewers, from the PSPs. And, and in many ways, I think in order to address that, we need to be looking at much more of a level playing field uh, when it comes to the PSPs, but also to some of the more global SFOD players as well. Uh, thank you, Mark. And, and James. Hi, everyone. My name is James Arnold. I'm Red Bermuda's Chief Commercial Officer. I've been with our company since it was formed in 2002 as a spin-out from the BBC. Um, like Mark, we're a provider to, to, this, to this market, this, this sector. Um, we provide a range of managed services. We provide playout services, media management services, OTT, access services, and content discovery. Um, and whilst we have a global business with activities in Australia, in the US and across Europe. In the UK, our customers include the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5 and BT Sport. So we've got a, a very clear and obviously vested interest uh, in the future success of public service broadcasting. Um, in terms of how do we see the future of uh, the UK's uh, future media sector, I think, um, I think we need to recognise what it is that makes the UK media sector so strong and so great and not lose sight of the fact that it's been um, always maintained the highest standards in terms of quality in terms of the content that's produced in the UK but also the content that's created in the UK as well um, and I think you know that that you know that's what's got us to have the reputation and the status that we have today and I think that will continue to be a key driver for why the UK industry has a, a strong and healthy future ahead of it. Um, it may sound slightly self-serving. What is a service provider to this sector? I think what we, we see our role here to support that is by allowing our customers, the broadcasters, the content providers to really focus on that aspect of what it is they do and then to rely on companies like us and other companies out there in the market who enable them to do things more efficiently in a more agile way and to better embrace the opportunities afforded by new technologies as they emerge. Uh, thank you, James. <coughs> uh, we've had one question in from uh, Nick Radlow that's um, questioning, maybe this is one for Patrick. Um, uh, 
it's not just a war against the BBC. It seems to have been extended to all PSBs and particularly Channel 4. Um, with your experience, uh, Patrick, I guess Channel 4 once again will be in question as part of this debate. Yes, of course. The um, I mean, this John Whittingdale in particular, who's been um, again floating the idea of uh, Channel 4 being privatized. Um, I think some of this is a question of sort of mindset that um, John and others who've been proposing this um, genuinely appear to believe that it is in Channel 4's interest for it to happen. And as they rightly say, wouldn't it be wonderful if Channel 4 were owned by someone with very deep pockets? Um, and, you know, the, the sustainability of the Channel 4 model, which is called the Robin Hood model, where you put in enough popular programs uh, to generate enough advertising revenue to enable you to do minority programs which which don't don't actually break even. And so far that has been extremely successful ever since 1982. And again, Channel 4 has had a decent year. So I think this idea that Channel 4 needs some help from the government privatizing it so that you know to sustain its future uh, isn't sort of justified in terms of of the sort of burning platform, which is sometimes claimed. But um, what's, what's more important is, is to say, if you did privatize Channel 4, who would be the likely buyers? And uh, certainly when I looked at this a couple of years ago, it was quite clear that the likely buyers would be almost certainly a very large US media and or tech company, which has to prioritize shareholder value. This doesn't mean these are not people who eat babies for breakfast. You know, it is their job to maximize shareholder value. That is not what public service broadcasting is about. Public service broadcasting is about broadcasting which is managed and regulated to deliver objectives which go beyond commercial objectives. They're not the opposite of commercial objectives because PSBs, of course, need audiences and so on. But it's not solely about maximizing audience size and therefore advertising revenue. And I think this is fundamentally about saying what would happen if. That's why the report we did was called The Consequences of, of, of Privatizing Channel 4. And it seemed to us that once you take a sort of rational policy perspective to say, if we did this, what would the likely consequences be, then it's very hard to, to support that policy, but it shouldn't be seen as an attack on Channel 4. Now, there are attacks on Channel 4 news, and that's another story, but um, the people who are proposing Channel 4 privatization honestly appear to believe they're helping. I don't um, agree with them. Thank, thank you, Patrick. Um, one of the questions I get asked often, and, and we're trying to find our way through is, is where should industry collaborate uh, and where should they compete? Um, and Mark, I wondered whether you're from your international perspective, you had some thoughts. Um, well, yes, I mean, um, as I mentioned um, at the opening, you know, I think there's certainly the TV industry in the UK is extremely collaborative um, and, you know, it has been very extremely successful. Um, but the, the, I think there are areas where we, you know, could certainly go more. And again, I mentioned with regards to some of the strategic partnerships with the PSBs. Um, you know, I think it's very interesting that, you know, we, we had several years back, the idea of uh, Project Kangaroo, which, um, you know, sort of brought together uh, at least three of the PSBs, uh, which unfortunately didn't go ahead. But we've now got something which is quite similar with, with, with BritBox, which is obviously then a pay service, which of course is then generating revenue. Um, and also as well with Freeview Play, which, you know, is, is a, um, a metadata aggregator, which allows, um, manufacturers like ourselves to create fantastic, you know, user experiences um, with a lot of content. One of the difficulties, though, is that you know, from that, uh, from those content deep link points on on a product, you're then taken into a siloed environment, so uh, an individual player. And I think that then, in many ways, there are barriers to certain consumers because we have then multiple sign-ins. Um, and I think that having potentially a single player which covers all of the PSPs, which would still include their, um, the, the attribution of their, of, of, of their branding very well, but you know, would, would then have a single environment where people may end up being more encouraged to spend more time in it, 
um, in, in a similar way to, uh, to, to the way that we see the likes of um, the, the, the SFODs um, trying to retain people within their applications. Um, and you know, but, but there's then opportunities as well for as well as, as, as free services as, as we have now, for potentially some kind of pay models with regards to um, removing adverts, um, as we see with things like um, ITV um, uh, Hub Plus, uh, which is available on Amazon, but also uh, personalized recommendations, um, early access to content, box sets, um, and greater access to back catalogs, uh, and so on and so forth. You know, so I think there are opportunities there, but at the same time, there are real, you know, chances for, you know, uh, the, the, particularly the, the PSBs to compete and very much around areas within the products that we're talking about, where actually they have no presence whatsoever, particularly around linear broadcast, you know, and I think that there's still a lot that could be done there. Um, and, you know, I think the, the way that the BBC has introduced the, the broadcast triggered applications, which then lead into their, um, their online apps, uh, particularly through HBB TV, um, are very, very good. But again, I think there's a great opportunity there. And I'd also like to see the other PSBs um, uh, introducing similar applications. I mean, you know, HBB TV is now supported on all of the devices pretty much in the, in the UK, all of the smart TVs. Um, you know, so it would be great to see that available on all of the PSB coverage and not just on the BBC. And I think that that would bring, you know, real sort of an uh, additional dynamic into, you know, feeding into those online environments uh, where we seem to be losing ground. Well, thanks, Mark. <clears throat> James, you, you, dare I say, metadata is in your DNA and you've been joining this stuff up for years. I mean, I suppose, you know, a very, a very simple answer to this is um, in all identifying those areas where the, uh, where the competition does exist, and, and recognizing that is very much in relation to the content, the quality of content and the audiences which you are targeting, but almost everything else should be a, a potential area or opportunity for, for greater collaboration. Um, I mean, the, our business is built on a principle of providing managed services, outsourcing, uh, which itself is uh, about organizations deciding what do they need to do themselves and what can they buy from the market. And a lot of what we do is about how we invest on behalf of our customers on standard products, standard platforms, uh, collaborative ways of working, so that effectively the, uh, the, our, our customers, the content providers, can really focus on those areas of differentiation. Um, we're, we're investing in such a way that we can bring multiple customers onto our platforms. Um, I think, you know, more and more organization, and I think we can see there's a lot of evidence already that the UK is embracing this, this type of mindset and this type of thinking uh, in what it's already done. I mean, the BBC back in just uh, around 2002 took the decision that it didn't need to own the, uh, some of the means of delivery of its services. And we've rolled that out. In fact, the UK is probably the most advanced market in that regard. And I think a continuation of that mindset will serve us well. And again, allow those areas of competition to become more, more obvious and more clear. And, uh, and that's where the, um, the activity can focus. Excellent, Claudia. You I'd like to add something to this. Like, I think I see, you know, an opportunity of stronger collaboration on something which is going to become primordial in the next decade, and it's improving the environmental impact and green production, um, both in terms of the content production, but also the CE manufacturing. I mean, there's some staggering figures, like, you know, one hour of television has been said to produce up to 13.6 metric tons of carbon dioxide, which equals the amount of energy required to run three homes for a year. So it's, you know, when you look at it in that perspective, there's got to be a better way. Um, it's also estimated, you know, when we think about the, the, the way uh, technology is shifting and user uh, consumption is shifting in terms of asphalt, it's estimated that data centers uh, supporting all these platforms will produce 3.2% of the world's carbon emissions by 2025. So there's, there's definitely something to be done there and it will be great to see more collaborations to advance faster instead of competing. And I know the colleagues here have some initiatives that might want to talk about. James, is it, is it worth you mentioning your green bee? I mean, in Red Bee, we have a, uh, a pro, um, an activity, a focus, which we call our green bee initiatives. And that really is, to your point, Claudia, it's about thinking about the energy consumption. We are one of those organizations which consumes data center 
capacity for the services that we provide. And we're working with our service provider, our, our suppliers, to make sure that we're initially measuring our energy consumption, and then we're looking at how we can make sure we can reduce our energy consumption. And it's becoming increasingly apparent to us that when we're competing for new business, our customers are also imposing those standards on us too. And that's fine. And we embrace that. And we actually think it's something which we can, we can you know, some, show some market leadership in. And equally, then when we're, when we're buying our services from the suppliers that support us, we're imposing those, those demands on them as well. So I think collectively, we're all, we're all signed up to what this is, this is about. And, um, and we have taken the steps now to think about how we measure and then we improve and also to use the word how we collaborate uh, we had a recent conversation with uh, a counterpart in sky who's running these initiatives there about how they drive efficiency uh, and uh, manage their carbon footprints within that organization i think there's a lot of information sharing going on here which i think will serve the industry well great thank you uh, we've got some questions coming in i'll try and see if i can get them to uh, come in live um Paul, Paul Gray, are you with us? Or oh, maybe not. I'll, I'll read Paul, Paul's question out. Um, Paul was asking whether the biggest challenge comes from um, the political environment or uh, the consumer trend towards um, new technology. So is it, is it political or is it technological and consumer behavior that's uh, making the big change. Maybe Paddy, that this might be one in your wheelhouse. I think it, 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 you have a different answer for the BBC and the commercial PSBs. That um, in the case of the commercial, it's, in, in both cases, it's mostly about money. Uh, in the case of the commercial PSBs, then uh, the big threat um, is uh, Google and Facebook um, taking the advertising money away. Um, and of course, the newspapers have this even worse. Um, and that is, if you like, the interaction between technology trends, consumer behavior, and then advertiser behavior, which follows consumer behavior. So I think in the case of the commercial PSBs, with that one sort of proviso about channel for privatization, I think that the threat is not primarily political. In the case of the BBC, I think the threat is primarily political and ideological and also commercial. So if we were to ask the question, who has been the BBC's biggest enemy uh, in the last 20 years, my answer would be Rupert Murdoch. And uh, the reason for that, um, or at least the assumed motivation behind that, uh, is a commercial one, a commercial vested interest. I think there's also very strong ideological uh, element to it as well. If I ask a different question, which is what is the biggest threat to the BBC at present, uh, then it is the funding cuts and the possibility of continuing funding cuts. As I've said, if the BBC's public funding has simply kept pace with general inflation, it would have vastly more resources to address the technology and consumer trends. Uh, thank you. Um, we all know the kind of the zeitgeist of this year has been streaming and, and actually um, during this remarkable year, the one thing that has happened is um, consumers have bought nearly seven million television sets. So, you know, television has got us through this, 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 this um, very unusual year in many ways. Um, but the UK is losing ground to the global giants and, and looking ahead to 2021 with some of these um, uh, changes having been accelerated and, and fewer behaviours uh, altered possibly permanently. Um, how would you sustain the UK's position in an open and competitive market? Um, Mark, I wonder whether you has any views on this. So the Ofcom's um, current consultation, the future of public service media has been mentioned several times. Um, and, and I think it's, it's a very interesting reading, um, this document, and obviously we, we, I think probably all of the manufacturers and the, and the PSBs and everybody else will be, will be responding to it. But the, it, it's, it's interesting, the, the, this switch or this change from a public service broadcast to public service media, um, and whether that would need to include then the SVOD players as well to make it, as I mentioned at the beginning, a more level playing um, field. Um, and, and whether that would require uh, additional regulation for, for, the, uh, for the SBODs or whether it would actually mean less regulation for the PSBs in an online world and making them more agile and able to 
uh, change more effectively and more quickly to the, the the environment that we're in, which you know is 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 so rapid, and and particularly as you start to see new big players entering. I mean, the the increase of of um, Disney Plus over the last six months has been absolutely astounding. To, I think to everybody, and it's just gathering more and more um, um, uh, momentum. So so I think that's certainly an area that um, you know ne needs to be addressed. Um, I don't have the answer for that, but I mean certainly I think as part of this consultation that will become clearer and clearer. And then the other uh, point is, is really to, to, to answer the question or try, to try and start looking at the question of, of why is you know, the, um, uh, that sort of um, uh, ground being lost. Um, and again, there's, there's been a lot of uh, discussions around things like prominence and the, the deep pockets that the SFOD players have um, and the way that they influence the user, the user interfaces. However, my experience as a manufacturer is actually I see that the, the, the PSB players are still as prominent as ever on those main home screens and continue to be so. Um, and certainly with the likes of Freeview Play, which has very strict prominence uh, guidelines and rules. And in order to, to, to carry that platform, the manufacturers have to abide by that. Um, and, and without doing so, actually are unable to carry the Freeview Play logo and therefore the players as certain manufacturers have found out. Um, but I think that it, it, we also have to look at um, some of the demographics, some of the age groups that actually are being lost. And particularly there's a lot of evidence to suggest the 16 to 24 year olds. And, and, and actually many of those, uh, th those uh, viewers are not necessarily using smart TVs. So this whole, whole issue of prominence is, is therefore not necessarily associated with the loss of their viewing. Um, you know, a lot of them are using uh, mobile devices and online devices such as laptops. So I think it really has to be, you know, there needs to be a focus on, on, on the reasons behind the loss of those viewers. Um, and, you know, I don't think it is it's purely round to um, the way that um, the s players are presented on, on smart TVs. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, one question in from uh, Chris Chinook um, has asked is, is the increased exporting of UK content an important element in the future of television? Um, my guess is it is, but uh, would anyone like to take that question? Well, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Claudia, sorry. Claudia. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, it's one of the points that I would have made today in any case, it's about the fact that, you know, the BBC has an amazing foothold internationally. So it's to be considered in this, you know, in these discussions, because it's not just a national pillar, but it has, you know, a huge footprint abroad, and it's the ultimate British brand uh, internationally. It's an ambassador of culture and a vector of soft power. Um, and notably through its, uh, its phenomenal content. So it's something that has incredible value, I would say. I, I fully, fully agree with that, Claudia. And uh, I, d I just noted at you as I was trying to sort my computer out for this call that the BB announcement by BBC Studios that they're launching something called BBC Select now. So again, it'll be fascinating to see how that, that works. I mean, clearly the BBC has identified a, an opportunity there to do exactly as you've described. And, uh, you know, uh, I'd like to believe that will be successful for the for all the right reasons. I think we can add to the fact that, of course, the new director general, um, Tim Davey, is not only a marketing person, you know, who started life at Procter and Gamble, uh, but also has been running um, the BBC commercial operation. So this is this is clearly very close to his heart as well. And given the importance of funding, uh, it's even more important uh, to keep maximising those those international opportunities. As Claudia says, um, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of that global BBC brand. It's a very, very highly trusted brand. It's actually the most trusted news source in the US. And that applies to Republicans as well as Democrats, <laughs> despite you know, the, the views of the 45th president. Um, so uh, the soft power aspect, as well as the export aspect, is hugely important. This is a success story, and we should keep reminding ourselves of that. A number of times we get asked, is there any way that the entire um, Freeview portfolio could be offered internationally? Uh, and I don't even begin to explain the complexity of rights there, but it does give an indication of the, the, the desire um, globally. Yeah. Um, if the BBC didn't exist, would we create it and what would it look like? That's a massive question. Um, I wonder whether, um, Paddy, maybe you'd have a quick go at this and then we'll just go across the panel. Sure. I mean, uh, if the BBC didn't exist, I think it's very unlikely uh, that uh, we would uh, create it and we would be very much poorer as a result of that. I think in the current ideological um, uh, climate where the tendency is to regard 
markets as the default for everything with, a, with exceptions, there's no way that you would sort of launch something like the BBC funded the way it is. I have to say that looking back in the research for the book, looking back at how they appointed John Reith in 1922, I'm amazed they did that. I would not have appointed him. He had, he was, you know, highly opinionated person with very little relevant experience, but thank God they did. Uh, so if it didn't exist, probably if you launch something like the BBC now, uh, it, it would, I suppose, be subscription funded, um, but it wouldn't be the BBC. Anyone else have a particular view on that, Claudia? Well, I, I have just like two ideas that I'd like to throw in there, um, especially to, this, to, the, to the question what it would look like. I think that it would, uh, I'm a big fan of the BBC, of course, and, and I would, you know, I think it would look like now, minus the gender pay gap and, uh, some, and with some real parity on airtime. And this is, you know, acknowledging that they've already done incredible progress on this. They've, uh, they've worked a lot on it, but it is uh, an industry and systemic issue that needs to be, uh, that needs to be covered. And then um, maybe it would be equipped with real time tools that adjust for diversity and gender representation and prevent biases and, uh, and thin stereotype live. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, testing and research going on in artificial intelligence on these type of things. And uh, it would be nice to see PSVs uh, being the ones really nailing it. Yeah, I think there's a real opportunity to, to embrace technology to improve that going forward. Um, <clears throat> What next? You know, if we're going to drive um, kind of uh, television, keep it universal, um, cross economic, social, age, and diversity, building on what Claudia just discussed, um, to bridge those boundaries, um, how do we sustain uh, the bedrock of the UK's identity and culture as part of public service media? Uh, and I guess in, a, in addition to that is thinking of technology, there must be technologies that we can use to help drive that as well. James, from a data perspective, there's a huge opportunity for us. It, it, is a, it is a huge opportunity. I mean, I think, you know, just going back to some of the points already made, I agree with, you know, everything that has been said, but, you know, thinking about, going back to your sort of principle around the threat to the UK sector, I think, you know, we can't ignore as Mark was saying, you know, Netflix, more than 200 million subscribers. Disney, from an early recent launch, almost 90 million subscribers. So we can't even get away from that. But I think, you know, I don't see that as all bad. I don't see that as all bad. I mean, I think what's staggering is some of the numbers here. I understand Netflix has spent approximately, are going to spend approximately $17 billion on content in 2020. Um, they're forecasting that by 2028, that'll be $20 billion. In the UK, the BBC spends about 1.5 billion uh, and over an ITV, just over a billion. But, but I think, you know, of that Netflix spend, they spent themselves almost uh, about a billion dollars in the UK. So whilst they are seen as the threat, they're also fueling and providing, uh, uh, investing in, in the UK creative industries themselves. So whilst you know, it's, a, it's a slightly different dimension, it is still uh, helping to, to, to fuel the, the UK creative industries. Um, but I think you're, you're absolutely right, Richard, to ask the question around how technology can help. And, and you know, we're ourselves looking to adopt um, cloud-based technologies, that's, that's the next iteration, that's the next step change in how technology is being rolled out. And we're using that to make sure that our services become increasingly agile, able to adapt, and recognizing that transition from the linear to the on-demand world. And, and metadata and understanding viewer behaviors and consumption patterns is very much influencing how we're thinking about our investments and how we can stay relevant and able to support our customers uh, in, in, their comp in their competitive activities. Can I just add to what James has said um, about sort of Netflix that the, uh, and, and, and the SVODs in general? Um, to me, the important thing is that it should be and not or. Okay, so the, the idea that we have, first of all, pay TV and, and now SVOD, in addition to a vibrant PSB sector, what's not to like, particularly if, if they're investing in the UK. I think the problem comes when you start saying, oh, well, we no longer need, you know, that universally available 
um, uh, public service broadcasting, making things which are local and fresh and news based and all those other things which are complementary. So as long as we've got a strong politically independent, well funded PSB sector, then adding more choice for those people willing and able to spend it. OK, so you know, don't forget over 40 percent of homes don't have yeah. um, VOD, OK, and, and the ones who don't tend to be older and poorer and all of those things. As long as it's and and not or, I think everything is positive. Once you start talking in terms of, of saying because we've got all this, we don't need what we've got, then I think you've got the problem. I couldn't agree more. I think it was comforting that um, Ofcom of um, maintained universality as a as a, um, a major tenant of um, public service media broadcasting. Claudia, sorry, you were trying to. Come no, in. no, I just I totally agree with Patrick, and I would like just to add. I'm always amazed at how sometimes you have some um, you know consumer views saying like, yeah, I don't understand why I have to pay for 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 uh, the, the the license fee because in any case I'm not watching and I'm watching Netflix, and it's like you know you there, there's you we can never stress enough that it's not the same value proposition. It is just not the same content offering. You know, it's it's one is inter purely entertainment, the other one. Has much more like the breadth of content is just unbelievable and it's especially first and foremost information uh, and then you know there's also content of a certain level of certain standards because it's not commercially uh, mandated so it's uh, you know i think it's important to keep on educating the public as well about like the different value propositions of this it's not just a different um, technology and access you know and tv consumption access it's really like the value proposition and the content is like completely different or complementary in any case I, I just just to add to that, and it almost goes back to the previous question: If the BBC didn't exist, would you create today? I agree with exactly what you said, Patrick, that you wouldn't create the BBC today. But I don't think that um, detracts from the need for a strong regulatory framework to do exactly what you're talking about, Claudia, because there is so much which is uh, motivated and um, required through the regulation, the regulatory framework which, which does exist. Because if you're just relying on pure economic principles, there are many parts of the market which would not get served because they aren't financially, uh, you, you can't invest in them. They don't, they don't provide that financial return. So you need some sort of framework which is robustly enforced, particularly as you know, we can see that a lot of what's happening online and with these global platforms are at the moment unregulated. And you know, I anticipate that with time and with just the sheer financial might of these organizations, they might start to embrace that, possibly before it's imposed upon them. But I think at the moment, you, it is critical that regulatory framework remains. So it, it, uh, just to come in there, I think it's interesting that actually, some, particularly the SPOD um, services, Netflix in particular, seem to be recognizing the need to, um, uh, to provide more um, sort of uh, public service yeah. Um, um, uh, programming and there was a, an article in the Guardian on Monday uh, which was Netflix pledges to be a force for good by diversifying its programming um, and it also mentions within there about growing focus on serving diverse uh, diverse UK audiences uh, through our own productions and therefore obviously um, also um, serving and, 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 um, and promoting um, the you know the, the, the TV and film biz um, industry within the UK um, and I think that they've also um, have invested in something like 14 sound stages at Shepparton as well. So, so certainly there is, they are bringing in, um, you know, economic growth. And I think there is a growing recognition that they also have to provide some, some kind of public service. Um, I mean, obviously not to the extent that the PSB is doing, certainly not the extent that the BBC does. But I think that there's a recognition that that is beginning to change. Claudia, I guess there's, yes. a, there's, there's another point in there is that they're just stealing our talent or are they growing their own? Because uh, a lot of executives and, and production people have moved across to Netflix in the UK. Yeah, it is an interesting trend, and not only in the UK. Actually, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a reflection that we're doing in uh, in we see that in a lot of other countries. So it's going to become um, a little bit more difficult now for the PSB to defend that point of being the guardians of local stories because, uh, you know. But at the same time, if the legislation will follow, if there is a proper legislation that you know levels the playing field, which is not the case today, you know, it makes it you know equally 
easy or hard, depending on the viewpoint, you know, for the productions um, to be able to access those talents and to be able to tell those stories, so then, 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 then there will be space for everybody. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, I want to just kind of like go back one second to your original question, because you were saying, you know, how do te television should be universal and how do we preserve, uh, we preserve that in the UK? And I just wanted to acknowledge that there's a lot that's already been done uh, by the BBC and C4, uh, Channel 4 specifically, um, they have some of the most advanced gender equality and diversity strategies uh, when we look at it from a European standpoint. I mean, after the Scandinavians, I would say the, the, the UK is really well on track to, to address these issues and to be very um, hands-on. And I know Tammy Hall has been really uh, driving this with relentless, uh, with relentless uh, force. So they have, have uh, you know, initiatives and they have money committed both to address it in-house, but also on content and on screen. Um, at the same time, I'd like to kind of pinpoint something which is happening, you know, from an industry standpoint is that diversity is now a little bit the, the, the key word and it's, there's a tendency to substitute gender equality. And so to just kind of like put the women under the umbrella of, uh, of diversity and it's a real danger because women still represent 52% of the audiences. Uh, and we do know, especially in media tech and in media broadcasting that they are uh, still the vast minority. So there's an, you know, an urgency to address that. Um, so it's important to leverage intersectionality strategies to keep on leveling the, the gender gap. And, uh, and then, you know, it's important to be very um, um, purposeful in wanting to create this diversity. And it's also a social diversity. So it means to, it means like, you know, going to promote and explain these media tech jobs, these new media tech jobs in all different areas throughout the countries, you know, when, with underprivileged communities and then create those social corridors that allow these communities to access the industry via internship, via apprenticeships, via scholarships. There are many different ways that can, can, that can be done. Um, there's a need to really measure, monitor, set quotas for diversity profiles in all of the media professions. Right now, there's a lot of the accent of what we see on screen or who's managing, but it's really relevant also for our segment, you know, like who Who's, who's behind, who's deciding the next innovation, who's behind, um, you know, who's, who's in the distribution line. And, um, and if, you know, if everybody puts their, their effort into that, uh, you know, with, with measurement and with real metrics, there's no reason why they shouldn't succeed. Um, there was one last point that I would like just to throw there is that as TV also migrates on platforms and digital ecosystems that are mobile native, I think that PSB should be joining the fight on screen addiction. And it's a difficult one to, to address because we're all into this eyeball, uh, eyeball race basically. But it is, a, it is a big problem. It is a really big problem for our teens and the youth. And it's something that, you know, in terms of the social impact, will need to be addressed. Uh, thank you, Claudia. Um, no, very, very important points. And I think social mobility and, and reaching um, further into um, certainly STEM and education is, is very, very important. Um, a couple of questions coming in, one from Stuart Savage from um, LG uh, about uh, distribution. Uh, he said linear TV is by no means dead. Uh, but terrestrial TV has a lot of low audience challenges, uh, sorry, low audience cha channels um, taking up uh, multiplex license space. Um, do we think we should follow the Italian model and reallocate uh, some of that bandwidth um, to more technically efficient um, uh, uses um, and, uh, and drive those channels to um, SVOD channels? Any views on distribution? No. Okay. Well, I mean, I think I think it's 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 neither either or, is it? I think I think one of the big challenges, of course, is that a lot of those those lower audience channels actually um, uh, are very profitable. Uh, and I think you know one of the, one of the conversations we've had in the past has been about the plus one channels, um, and actually those plus one channels are very viable. So um, I think That's it's great. probably being led by the viewer. I, mean, I suppose, Richard, you know, as a, as a company which has been advised, looked, um, has, uh, has seen linear as being on a steady decline for many years, but actually continues to be surprisingly robust uh, despite all of that. Um, it is interesting just, you know, we, we recognise and we see the migration of services from a linear, linear proposition to an over-the-top proposition. It's certainly the case that uh, linear broadcasting, linear TV, 
has quite a few costs attached to it. So it might be the obvious thing for, for low consumption channels where subscription or, or, or just the simple economics don't facilitate uh, uh, the, the costs associated with early broadcasting to move to an alternative platform. Um, you then need to make sure, of course, it is available to that target audience that you want to make it available to. But I think it is, you know, the, the migration from linear to non-linear is something which we're observing. And actually, it's at the core of what we're trying to provide as a service to our customers. I mean, you know, the, the, the obvious example that we can all point to is BBC Three, I suppose, but um, that's not necessarily taking its audience with it. So I think you know, we've got to think about how you, 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 you achieve that transition to achieve the, the benefits of a lower cost and therefore putting more of your money into content, but also keeping your audience um, that you, you were originally serving. Uh, thank you, James. Um, so uh, I'm conscious of time. Uh, this is a, a, an enormous subject and a subject that we are no doubt uh, going to come back to um, uh, in great detail over the coming months uh, uh, and not least before the Ofcom uh, consultation uh, finishes on the 16th of March. So I'd really encourage uh, industry and members to engage on this. Um, I'd just like to come back to the exam question, I guess. Um, how do we secure the UK's TV experience and industry going forward? Um, and uh, I, so I'll come back to the panel in, in reverse order with um, James, Mark, um, and then uh, Claudia and Patrick. Um. I think it's a very, very simple answer. I think it draws on all the themes we've talked about, which is recognizing what it is that's made the, the UK industry this, as strong as it is today. Uh, it's maintaining that focus on that, looking, looking to other organizations, other, other ways of, of delivering the more mundane sort of back office activities which support that, but maintaining that focus on content, the quality of content, the diversity of the content that's being offered, and, um, and looking to embrace the potential opportunities that the global providers can bring, not just um, uh, to, you know, just don't, don't see that just as a competitive threat, but also an opportunity too, because let's not forget, they do carry a lot of UK content as well on their platforms. Mark? So, so I would completely agree with that. I, you know, I think that um, the, 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 the global um, services are, are, are providing, you know, a lot of economic benefit and also, you know, a lot of con content and entertainment to the UK. But at the same time, we need to make sure that the ongoing collaborations within the UK TV industry are, are, are maintained and strengthened. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I think there's good opportunities for further strategic partnerships between the PSBs as well um, to really try and look at how they maintain or increase their, uh, their, their viewers and, uh, and make sure that they um, don't uh, lose further to some of the, the large uh, global providers. Thank you. And um, Claudia? But if I could just choose two messages, I would say diversify or die. And then the other one is, um, I would say like really collaborate on the sustainability and environmental impact. Excellent. And um, the last word, Patrick. Well, of course, it's uh, what people have said. So continuing pressure on uh, efficiency, collaboration, uh, the value of exports, by the way, because that, that brings money to invest in, in original UK content. I think um, on regulation, we need more of a level playing field. Um, this is part of a much wider challenge which to do with regulating um, big technology companies which now the FTC and several states in the US are finally sort of <laughs> confronting Facebook rather more seriously um, but there are also sort of little things like listed events all right say so listed events have to be available universally available free to air um, that actually makes a significant difference having said that um, the single biggest thing, uh, which is what I said right at the top, uh, is that uh, the BBC sits at the heart of all this. It has had its funding cut very deeply, 30% in the last 10 years, and we won't be able to get that funding fully back again. But the single biggest threat to the BBC is the idea that it should be funding free TV licenses for anyone, um, and it shouldn't. This is a welfare benefit uh, the actual amount of money in terms of the treasury is simply a rounding error, but it's a huge amount of money relative to the amount of money the BBC has to spend on content. So if you could only do one thing, it would be 
to make sure that free TV licenses were funded as a welfare benefit, like the much more expensive uh, winter fuel allowance um, out of general taxation. That would make a transformational difference to the whole ecosystem. Uh, thank you, Paddy. Um, and uh, thank you, James, uh, Claudia, Mark, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, that concludes our virtual um, sessions for the year. Um, so it just leaves me to um, thank uh, you for joining us. Um, I wish you uh, a very good Christmas break uh, and a prosperous new year. Um, and you never know, we might even manage to see each other face to face in 2021, which I think we're all very keen for. So um, thank you very much. Uh, have a great Christmas and we'll see you in the new year. Merry Christmas. Thank Merry you. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.